Daniel chapter 5 is where we're looking today. And before we look at uh, this chapter, I'd like to ask you to envision with me the making of a movie. I love movies, and I'm an armchair director. And if I were to make a movie of chapter 5, it sounds like I'm pitching a movie this morning, okay, to a producer. But I want you to imagine with me how I would begin this movie. The first thing that would happen in the movie that tells the story of Daniel chapter 5 would be that there would be a blank screen. The lights go out, the screen is blank, and slowly you see the words of Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 12, appear on the screen, which will say, Then it will come to pass, when 70 years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord, and I will make it a perpetual desolation. And I'd let those words shine on the screen for a moment. Why? Because that is a promise from God that gives the content to what we are about to see in the unfolding story of the book of Daniel chapter 5. God made a promise concerning his people. Israel, he would take them into captivity to the land of Babylon for 70 years, not 71, not 69, but 70. And they would serve in the land of Babylon in exile for that duration. And now... As we come to Daniel chapter 5, the 70 years is almost complete. God is about to keep his promise regarding not only his people, but also the nation of Babylon. So let those words shine on the screen for a few moments, and then let them fade into black and then slowly what you would see is the image of a nighttime scene. The moon is high in the sky. It's shining down on the capital city of the empire of Babylon. You see the glistening of the river Euphrates as it runs through and along and through the capital city of Babylon. And you see the image of this mighty city that is so impenetrable. It is well fortified. Did you know that the walls of the city were so thick? Historians tell us four chariots can ride abreast. There's no way to break in. And the river Euphrates runs not just around, but through the city, underground, and then through the city so that it is well supplied with water from the mighty Euphrates River. And then the city itself is well stocked and well supplied, prepared for any siege that any enemy might try to impose upon the city itself. It's well protected. And even in the moonlight, even at night, you'd be impressed by the size of the city and the impossibility of any enemy army to get in and conquer it. And then the camera would train down on, indeed, the army, that it was even then trying to piece together how to get in. Cut to the general of the army of the Medes and the Persians, because he's rubbing his chin thinking, how do I do this? How do I conquer this unconquerable city? It seemed impossible. There's uh, just, even in the moonlight, it seems like a big gigantic block that it's impossible to break into with the river Euphrates going through it. And then he thought to himself, oh, that river, that river, something about that river. And he didn't know this, 
But way back in Jeremiah chapter 51, God said this about, uh, about him and about this whole idea. It says, Behold, I will plead your case, talking to Babylon, God speaking to Babylon. Behold, I will plead your case and take vengeance for you. I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. And this mighty general wouldn't have understood that. But he would look at this river and he'd say, if we could just get this river out of the way. It's a crazy idea. But what if we diverted the water? There's a, there's a dry lake nearby. What if we ran a channel that would run that water into that lake and drain the level and the power of the mighty Euphrates? Then the water level would go down. The force of that flow would diminish. And I think soldiers can walk on the riverbed under the city. And so that's what he did. I think God put that idea in his head. And he actually had his soldiers dig a trench to run the water from the Euphrates into this dry lake. And he watched and he watched. It's working. It's working. The river is getting thinner. It's getting, the flow is less strong. I think now we can actually wade in and go under the wall and sneak in and no one would know. Now cut, hard cut, to the sound of a party going on, loud music. You'd see then the image of a great banquet going on inside the city. King Belshazzar, the king of the Babylonian Empire, was putting on a tremendous feast. Everyone was getting, getting tipsy, and he was arrogant, and he was proud, and he was also drunk. And he would not have known what it also said about him in Jeremiah chapter 51 and his kingdom where it says in verse 57, and I will make drunk her princes and wise men, her governors, her deputies, her mighty men, and they shall sleep a perpetual sleep and not awake, says the king whose name is the Lord of hosts. And as this drunken party was going on, unbeknownst to him, on October 12, 539 B.C., the Median Persian Empire slipped under the wall through the Euphrates River and stepped in and conquered the Babylonian Empire in one night without a battle. People went to bed, Babylonian, woke up, Median Persian, and in just a matter of hours, this king is dead. It's not a movie. This really happened. And what's the point of this story? I believe the point of this story has to do with the defiance of kings against Almighty God. From the time of the times of the Gentiles, which began with King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon all the way up to the time of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Nations have proudly shaken their fist at Almighty God. You are not the God. We are. You are not the King. We are. And I believe this story is meant to show us that our sovereign God will one day bring down in pride every nation that rebels against him. And it'll happen quick. And it can happen in a moment, as it did here. This is a lesson for you and me, you see, to make sure that our focus is on the right king. That we're looking to the king of kings and lord of lords. The one that it says in chapter 4 repeatedly, the, uh, the uh, one who is, as it says, uh, the most high who rules over the kingdoms of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And this is an attack from God 
on the arrogance that began. Now think about this. It began with the Tower of Babel, where Babylon began. In arrogance, they built that tower to defy Almighty God, and he confused the languages. It will go all the way to the book of Revelation, chapter 13 and 14, where, and then chapter 17 and 18, where in a revived Babylonian kingdom that's uh, called Mystery Babylon the Great, where God will bring judgment on a world system that defies him. And here, illustrated to us in Daniel chapter 5, that whole idea, our sovereign God will one day bring down the pride of the nations that rebel against him. And you and I respond to this by making sure that our eyes are on Jesus Christ, that we don't give up, that we don't become defeated, we remain true to him. Because our God can bring an end to a kingdom in a night. So let's look at this story. Starts off in chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Understand this is going on while the Median Persian Empire is sneaking in underneath. While he tasted the wine, very euphemistic way to put it, isn't it? Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, drink from them. Now let's take a moment to think of who this man is, Belshazzar. He is the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar the Great. Now, you remember Nebuchadnezzar the Great? Chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. We've already learned about him. And he was given that mighty dream in chapter 2 where he was the head of gold over a figure, a statue, that represented all of the nations that would come after him. Babylon, he was the head of the gold. He was the first one. Medea, Persia, the arms. Greece, the belly. The iron legs of Rome and the ten feet of a divided Roman Empire in the future. He was the head of gold. And you remember how God humbled him. He was prideful. And one, one night God told him, you're going to, uh, I'm going to take the kingdom from you. You're going to crawl around the ground like an animal for seven years. God took his reason away from him and he was an animal for seven years. And at the end of that seven years, his reason was restored to him, and he gave glory to the Most High who rules over the, the affairs of men. Now that's the grandfather of this man. Here's what happened. Nebuchadnezzar died at age 43. And clearly, at the time of his death, he had, he had given honor to the God of Israel. He believed on him. His son, evil Merodach, How's that for a name? How you like looking at your baby and say, I got a name for him, Evil Merodach. Um, but that was his son's name. He reigned for two years before he was murdered by his brother-in-law, who then reigned for three years until he died, and his son, a child, reigned for nine whole months before he was murdered by conspirators. The conspirators made one of their number, a man named Nebonidus, the emperor of the Babylonian Empire. And Nebonidus was gone most of the time, and so he made his son co-regent with him. That co-regent is this man. Belshazzar. By the way, he grew up in a dysfunctional family, as you can tell. But he is the grandson of Nebuchadnezzar the Great through his mother. Now think about Daniel for a moment. Let's put this whole chapter in its context. The book of Daniel is put in the category of our Bible as the, a book of prophecy. But here's the thing. 
prophecies only occur in the latter six chapters of Daniel. The first six chapters are the story of this man, Daniel, through whom God gave these tremendous prophecies. Chapters 1 and 2 deal with Daniel's youth. Shortly after he was taken captive among the other Jewish people and brought to Babylon. Chapters 3 through 4 deals with his middle age. And chapters 5 through 6 deal with his older years. Seventy years have gone to pass now from the beginning of his captivity. So Daniel is now a man at about 87, 88 years old. He is an old man. And this is the context of the story. Belshazzar puts on a great feast while his father is gone, perpetuating the attitude of his father, turning his nation increasingly to the worship of pagan gods, and so he does something unspeakable. He calls for the goblets, the, the, the vessels that were formerly in the temple of Almighty God in Jerusalem. He called for those to be brought out to him. They'd been kept in security before then. He called for those to be out, brought out, filled them with wine in this drunken party, and lifted them up in honor to false gods. What a thing to do. In other words, this was an act of defiance against the one true God because he knew what he was doing. The Bible tells us that those vessels were kept by God. In Jeremiah chapter 27, it says that they will be brought back to the temple. God kept them in security. They should have been treated with holiness. Instead, he took the things of God and used them to sin. You go, how shocking. Wait a minute, brothers and sisters in Christ. Just a few months ago, Easter Sunday, the day that is meant to worship, uh, be, be set aside for the worship of Christians around the world to remember the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, the leaders of our nation used that day to celebrate a national day of sexual perversion. You remember that? The sin that, Neb that Belshazzar committed is not that far removed from us. That's why we need to pray for revival in our time. So that's what he did. He lifted up these goblets. And it says in verses 3 through 4, they brought out the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. The king and his lords and his wives, his concubines, drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, wood, or iron, wood, and stone. And that's when God moved. Now, God had already, the, the, the doom was already in process, wasn't it? Underneath the city. But now God makes it known. And he chooses that moment. It tells us in verses 5 through 9, in the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. In other words, while he's in the midst of this feast, at a portion of the, the hall where he would have been sitting, where the lamps were shining, the plaster wall behind him, a hand appeared and wrote on the wall. No arm, no body, just a hand. And it tells us that the king's countenance changed. What a nice way to put it. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. If I were making that movie, I'd sure want to make sure that that's in there. The sound of those knees knocking. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers the Chaldeans, the soothsayers, the king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. In other words, he did what his father, uh, his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar did, 
when God gave him that dream, he called for all of his pagan advisors and they couldn't give an answer. And now he, he must know the writing. He must know the meaning of it because clearly this is from God. And so he calls these pagan advisors who could not help him at all. It tells us in verse 8, Now all the king's wise men came, but they could not read the writing or make known the king its interpretation. You know, and it wasn't because they couldn't make sense of what it said. The letter forms were very obviously in a language that they would have known, but it was like in a formula that they couldn't understand. It would be like a little child could, can read E equals MC squared, can make out the letters, but not know what the formula means. And so he called all of these advisors, and they were, I don't know, and the king was greatly troubled, and his countenance was changed, and his lords were astonished. That means they were perplexed too, and I would say they were terrified because they knew what his grandfather once tried to do. When they couldn't give an answer to him at that time, he said, well, let's just kill off all the wise men. Who knows what this madman will do? What a moment. And then at that moment, the queen appears. Now, this queen is not his wife. His wives are already in the, the blasphemous feast, as we're told in verse 2. This would be probably the, the, his grandmother or perhaps his mother, the queen mum. And she would most likely have been someone who knew the past, knew the story. It's clear that she knew who Daniel was. It's clear that she has some sense of reverence for the God of Israel. So I'd say it's probably his grandmother or his mother. And the queen, it says in verse 10, because of the words of the king, she comes and she is so respectful and so calm. Because of the words of the king and his lords came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke saying, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. Inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge and understanding, interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enig enigmas were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation. In the original language, by the way, where it says explaining enig enigmas, it's tough to say, the original language is Untying knots. I like that. He's an untier of knots. Call Daniel. Now it says something about this woman, that she knew who Daniel was. And it says something about how she knew that the Holy Spirit was upon him. But it also says a lot about Belshazzar, that he had no clue who he was. And so it tells us in verse 13, then Daniel was brought in before the king. Where was Daniel, by the way, in all of this time? I think that he was possibly in retirement at age 80, upper 80s. It could be that Belshazzar, when he came into power, fired him. It could be that uh, he just wanted to stay away from this crowd. He was a holy man. But you know, if you look at chapter one, chapter 7, verse 1, and you look at chapter 8, verse 1, you will see that already earlier in the reign of Belshazzar, God had told Daniel what's going to happen. So none of this was a surprise to him. So Daniel comes respectfully. The king spoke, verse 13, said to Daniel, Are you that Daniel who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought, in, brought from Judah? I have heard of you 
that the Spirit of God is in you, that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers, have been brought in before me that they should read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, but they could not give the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. Now if you can read the writing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Why third ruler, by the way? Well, because his father, Nabonidus, is the first. He's the second. That would make Daniel the third. And the offer, wow, in any other context, might sound very tempting. Be clothed in robe of royalty, have a gold chain of authority around your neck, and be number three in a kingdom. Turns out a kingdom that isn't going to last the night. What a worthless offer. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and your rewards to another. Give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. It is not God's place for Daniel to be a, a ruler, but it is God's place for Daniel that he speak the truth. And so he does. And listen, first of all, to how he respectfully but clearly rebukes Belshazzar. Verse 18, O king, the Most High God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen and his body was wet with the dew of heaven till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this. So you see, this was an act of defiance. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his house before you. And you and your lords, your wives, your concubines have drank wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, nor hear, nor know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. And brothers and sisters in Christ, that is a picture of the kingdoms of this world in defiance against God. So then comes the interpretation. First he tells what the, dream, what the writing on the wall says. Daniel says, verse 24, Then the fingers of a hand were sent from him. This is from God directly as a response to your defiance to him. And this writing was written, and this is the inscription that was written. Mini, mini, tekel, you farsen. By the way, these are words of units of measurement. A mina is a unit of coin. Tekel is Aramaic for shekel, which is a, a coin determined by weight. And upharsin is the word parsis with the uh, consecutive uh, 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 connective in front of it to make it upharsin. And that's... Uh, that's a word that means divided. It means taking a mina and breaking it in two so that it can be divided. 
So if you were to translate this literally, it would be numbered, numbered, weighed, and divided. Now you'd look at that and you go, what in the world does that mean? Well, Daniel says this, verses 26 through 28. This is the interpretation of each word, meaning God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. <clears throat> There's two meanings, <laughs> which means the certainty of it. God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Persis, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. In other words, it could be translated this way. The mighty God, the God who rules over all the kingdoms has looked at you, Belshazzar. He's, he's weighed you out and your days are numbered. Your number's up. He's put you on the balances and you think you're all that but he's found you lighter than anything. And now comes division. Your kingdom is going to be taken from you and split up and divided among the Medes and the Persians. What a message. How does Belshazzar react? It doesn't seem like it's sunk in. Because it says, verse 29, Then Belshazzar gave the command, and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck, made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler of the kingdom. Maybe he was trying to buy God off. Here, I'll reward your guy. And you'd, you'd have to say that for a brief moment, this Jewish man, this former captive, became, for a few minutes, the number three in a world empire which was destroyed by mourning. It tells us, verse 29, then Pel uh, verse 30, that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Nebuchadnezzar was later captured. And you know what happened to Daniel? He survived and became a high official in the next world empire of the Median Persian Empire, there is, I don't think, any other human being in history that had happened what Daniel had happened to him. To go from a high official in one empire to then survive its destruction and become the high official of the, secutive, the consecutive world empire. Who in history could ever have said that? He was God's man. And we'll read about his... Involvement in the next empire in chapter 6. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years of age. I think it'd make a great movie. Because it's, and I'd have to put based on actual events. What's the point of this story? The point of this story is that our God is a mighty God who rules over the nations. And every nation that defies him, he is able to put down. And he is able to put another in its place because he is the most high that rules over the kingdoms of men and is able to put whoever he wishes in position. And I think that what this message is to the kingdoms of this world is what we find in Psalm 2. Kiss the son, lest he be angry. Because he will rule. And what does this have to do with you and me, brothers and sisters in Christ? You and I who love the Lord Jesus Christ, who have put our faith in him, who recognize and will celebrate this morning his, his sacrifice uh, for us on the, the cross. I think you find God's message to us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in closing, let me read these words to you. I don't have to explain them. You'll know the point. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. But concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord 
so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should come overtake you. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night and of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would keep our focus on the Lord Jesus Christ and not let us wander from him one little bit as we look at the world events flowing on around us. Father, we don't know if we are living in those last days yet. You've promised in your word that before those days come, there would be a great falling away. And we certainly feel as if we are seeing a falling away going on around us. Help us, Father, to keep watch. Help us to keep to our duty, to, to hold on and keep our eyes upon Jesus Christ so that when he comes, he does not find us doing anything but what he has given us to do. And Father, we praise you for the day when Jesus Christ will reign over the kingdoms of this earth. They will be handed to him. And we will reign with him. Help us to keep that focus and keep that point of view. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.